Mr. President, please be seated. The court is now back in session. Without further ado, we would like now to hand over to the co-prosecutor to continue putting or to presenting the, the, question, uh, the documents before the chamber. Counsel for Mr. Nunchia, you're on your feet. You may proceed first. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honors. My reason for rising uh, now concerns the presentation of uh, key documents we heard this morning from uh, the international co-prosecutor, uh, for which we feel compelled to offer our compliments. We found Mr. Smith's presentation informative in large part because it began to provide insight into the co-prosecutor's closing submissions. And it was clear to us as we listened to the presentation that this is what the presentation so far amounts to. Uh, Mr. Smith continually used languages, language such as significant, uh, significantly probative, demonstrate, shows. He even used the words we submit, which transform these proceedings from a presentation of documents into a form of what you might call preliminary closing submissions. That aspect of the presentation stood, um, in our opinion, in contrast with the one delivered last week by Mr. Rayner, which, while also in its way dramatic, was limited far more to the content of the documents as such. By virtue of the nature of the argument put forward by the international co-prosecutor this morning, and in particular the submissions it contained, we were struck by the importance of this hearing to these proceedings as a whole. Indeed, Mr. President, we note that the Chamber itself recognizes the significance of this hearing and in particular the importance of the presence of the accused. Having ordered, above the objections of counsel, the appearance in court <coughs> of Mr. Kyo Sampan during the portion of the document hearing which concerns his role in democratic Kampuchea. We agree wholeheartedly and believe that the presence of our client during the portion of proceedings to concern his role in democratic Kampuchea is equally important. The Chamber will note that my colleague Sonarun is not currently present in court. Right now he is en route to the Khmer Soviet Hospital where he will meet with Mr. Nguyen Chia and advise him of the nature of the proceedings as they have unfolded so far here today and of our joint recommendation that Mr. Nguyen Chia withdraw his waiver of his right to be present with regard to document presentation hearings as far as they concern his particular role in democratic Kapuchia. Uh, once Mr. Sonarun has an opportunity to confer with our client, uh, we are indeed hopeful that Mr. Nguyen Chia will be able uh, to give instructions with respect to this hearing. And in that regard, I may note that uh, Sonarun and I had the opportunity uh, to visit with our client yesterday. And uh, we're not only troubled, but also shocked to find a significant deterioration in his condition from our most recent visit only four days prior on Friday, January 26. Uh, 
By way of emphasizing, Mr. President, the extent of that surprise, the Chamber may remember that just yesterday I informed the Court that our client was improving, his health was improving. Information which was based on the medical report previously received by Your Honours as well as ourselves yesterday morning. Now that information uh, no longer reflects the reality as we witnessed it yesterday afternoon. Indeed, for reasons I will not elaborate on at this time in public, both Mr. Nguyen Chia and his family were convinced and had been for at least two days that Mr. Nguyen Chia was approaching death. I give the Chamber this information at this time primarily to provide context for our client's possible withdrawal of his waiver. Mr. President, Your Honours, we anticipate having an update in that regard this afternoon and will inform the Chamber as soon as we receive instructions from our client, of course, assuming he is able to do so. Thank you very much. The President, thank you. Then the National Court Prosecutor, you may now proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just in a brief response, uh, Mr. President, um, certainly um, the prosecution are not intending to make closing submissions on, this, uh, on these documents. Um, all we aim to do is provide um, a brief signpost as to the, the relevance and probative value of the evidence. And certainly, um, um, if on occasion um, I've done a fraction more than that. That certainly wasn't the intention. So um, I'll give brief signposts as to why it's relevant and probative. Um, as far as uh, submissions, we certainly uh, uh, are not uh, intending to do that. For, if I overstepped on one or two occasions, uh, I apologise for that. Your Honours, um, when we uh, left before lunch, we were looking at speeches by Yang Sari and uh, documentation uh, that was being sent to the uh, Commission on Human Rights or the Subcommission on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities. Um, the previous document we looked at was where uh, Yang Sari, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, was uh, rebuking um, countries that were uh, alleging that there were human rights abuses occurring in Cambodia in uh, 1978. The document we looked at before was dated the 20th of September 1978, and I overlooked um, this other document, E3-1337, which again is a telegram from the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, to the uh, Subcommission sub on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities, uh, rebuking um, the British government for making, uh, asking for investigation into crimes uh, occurring in, uh, in Cambodia at the time. The date of the document is the 13th of June, when the Secretary General resubmitted or submitted the telegram or the letter from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which was dated on the 22nd of April, 1978. And I'm looking at the English 0023-5721, Khmer 0033-3906, and French 0023-5729. And the, the notice is headed uh, from the Secretary General question of the violation of human rights and fundamental freedoms in any part of the world, with particular reference to the colonial and other dependent countries and territories. Note by Secretary-General, 
The Secretary General has received a note from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Democratic Kampuchea dated the 22nd of April 78 with a request that it be circulated in an official document to the competent bodies of the United Nations and all member states. The, uh, the contents of that communication from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is then included in this document and I won't read out all of it but just a few uh, significant parts that uh, indicate uh, the role that Yang Sari was playing particularly in that year. At paragraph two, the letter states, in particular, the propaganda machine of the imperialists, expansionists and annexationists has raised what it calls the human rights issue in its slander and denigration of democratic Kampuchea. This infamous, infamous calumny against the people of Kampuchea is no new development and did not take by surprise the people and government of democratic Kampuchea. The imperialists, expansionists, and annexationists have conducted their campaigns of denigration against the people of Kampuchea ever since the latter rose up in defiance of their domination, oppression and exploitation. At that time, they not only launched verbal attacks but also repressed and massacred the people of Kampuchea in an attempt to stifle the latter's struggle. The communication goes on at paragraph 6, where the Ministry states, What qualities does the British government presume to have that it plays at being a humanitarian apostle? In reality, the British government represents the British colonialist and imperialist regime, which is known as the most infamous and abject in the history of mankind. The British imperialists and colonialists were extremely barbaric and cruel in the past. Their nature has not changed. They are still extremely barbaric and cruel. They have simply undergone a slight change of face because they no longer have sufficient strength to oppose the immense forces of the peoples of the world. The communication goes on at paragraph 8 where it stated, the British imperialists and the British government give little consideration to the British people. How can they love the people of Kampuchea more than the British people? Can they raise the question of human rights without basing their arguments on the logic of imperialists, exploiters, oppressors and plunderers? The British government has no right to interfere in the eternal affairs of democratic Kampuchea. The people and the government of democratic Kampuchea condemn with their last ounce of strength the odious inference of the British government as an affront to the honour and dignity of the Kampuchean people and to the sovereignty of democratic Kampuchea. Further at paragraph 10, the ministry states, over the past three years, the people of Kampuchea have smashed the espionage and subversive activities of the imperialists, expansionists and annexationists and their supporters together with their attempts to overthrow democratic Kampuchea. The people of Kampuchea have therefore victoriously safeguarded, strengthened, expanded and embellished the power of the worker peasant people. At the same time, the people and Revolutionary Army of Kampuchea have overcome the acts of aggression of all foreign enemies and have defended and fully safeguarded the independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity of democratic Kampuchea. At paragraph 11, progress has also been achieved in building the new society which is a collective society in accordance with the fundamental aspirations of the people. The old relations of production based on oppression and exploitation have been completely abolished and the new relations of production based on independence, equality and socialist collectivism 
have been steadily strengthened and developed. All the forces of production have been liberated. In democratic Kampuchea today, there are no longer any imperialists or expansionists who merely mess the fruits of the labor of our people, fruits paid for with our sweat and blood. The former government employees, who are simple citizens once again, <coughs> fulfill their daily tasks and live just like the people and the administrators. On the basis of equality, they support the new regime, which can both defend the country effectively and ensure its rapid development. They are also pleased to have participated in the construction of the new society, since much is the road to honour for patriots in Kampuchea. Everyone is equal and there are no exploiters or exploited. All peasants control the rice paddies and the fields and all workers, the factories, they have the right to decide and dispose. All the fruits paid for with the sweat and blood of the people come back to the people and not to anyone else. Moving to paragraph 13, which is at Khmer 00333917 and French 00235736 and English 00235727, the communication from the ministry goes on to say, uh, it knows in the mobilization of national and popular forces, the government of democratic Kampuchea has well-defined policies which make a clear distinction between strategic and tactical forces. It knows perfectly well when to unclear the word. When to struggle with determination and when to unite and when to make concessions and show mercy. However, when dealing with a handful of traitors, the agents of foreign imperialists and reactionaries who seek to destroy their own nation, their own people and their own revolution, the government applies a dictatorship of the proletariat resolutely and rigorously. And at paragraph 15, it concludes it is therefore invaluable that the government of democratic Kampuchea considers that the United Nations should reject the slander and calumny of the imperialists and expansionists and exationists and their supporters against democratic Kampuchea, particularly the interference in the international affairs or internal affairs of democratic Kampuchea on the part of the British government. It should reject the slander and calumny of hoodlums, traitors, and stateless persons. The United Nations should support the efforts of the people of Kampuchea, who are currently struggling to construct a new society where the exploitation of man by man no longer exists and people enjoy genuine rights and freedoms. Four, if there was no genuine rights or freedoms, and if the new regime in Kampuchea were exploiting and oppressing the people, the latter would undoubtedly destroy that regime. Your Honour, that document, that communication, um, helps assist in providing some understanding of the role that Yang Sari played <laughs> during the DK period. Your Honours, I would like, now like to turn to uh, documents that were recovered from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and provide an insider's account of what was occurring inside foreign affairs whilst those statements were being made publicly outside. And if I can refer to E3 slash 522, and this document is entitled The Diary of the Khmer Rouge Foreign Ministry and it was found, the anonymous document was discovered in early 1979 
and this can be found on page 000 3239 in the English, by a Cambodian returning to Phnom Penh from the countryside who found it and a number of other documents in a house apparently belonging to Yang Sari. Uh, the author of the document is unnamed, but within the document, uh, the Yang Sari's revolutionary name Van appears on a number of occasions. The document is dated from the 21st of May 1976 to the 5th of January 1979, and it's a handwritten, often shorthand and abbreviated form of a document of 152 double pages of a, of a black diary, a blank diary, printed by the Lon Nol era uh, Society Khmer Distilleries. The first entry appears on the 7th of January, 21st of May, 1976, and the last two days before the overthrow of the Pol Pot regime. The diary um, appears to be uh, an account of the uh, meetings uh, held within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and congresses uh, that were held uh, there um, by them. The document um, assists in showing uh, the atmosphere in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the time and uh, the role that Yang Sari played um, within the ministry. Interestingly, at um, English page 00003243, um, the first tra the translation of the no notes uh, is a translation of the information relating to the party statutes and largely reflects what is in the party statute. At um, English 0003247, um, we see um, that the title of the page, The Cell Congress, 22nd of May 1976, uh, appears to be the cell within uh, within the reports of the cells within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. At the bottom of that page, it states, Brother Van's opinion. And it states, the reports made by the cells are quite good and lessons could be learned in the cells. If we look at um, the Khmer page 0042, 7832 to 33, and the English ERN 0003254, we can see it's recorded in one of these meetings the following comments. The enemies of Cambodia, the arms and legs of the traitors who are their lackeys, the imperialists and the liberals who bury themselves to carry out secret activities, they divert the line, they provoke internal rebellion consciousness of private property is an enemy of the revolution. Then at 0003282, um, there is an entry in relation to um, the fact of uh, evacuation, evacuating people. And the entry states, for example, concerning the removal of the people, the world estimates that someday we will let the people return to the cities. This shows that those who understand us understand only in strategy. You may ask, why, the, why have they such an idea? This is because they have never practiced this way, transferring people from urban areas to rural areas. The problem, they think, is how to supply food and shelter. That's at Khmer 0042-7872. And further down it states, see that we have preserved the revolutionary achievements by transferring people and terminating the use of currency. Money is a major asset. If we use money, it's very powerful. If we go to 
0003216 in the English and 0042-7921 in the Khmer, we have uh, a title, Van's Comments About Conrade, Comrade Chaim. Advantages. One, loyal, never secret. Maintain the close working relations with the mass. Fulfill the tasks without any conditions. If compared to the socialist revolution, there is still a great lack. Sorry, I'll slow down, Your Honour. Point two, the leadership behaviour still exercise martial and authoritative with our people, especially with base people. Get rid of the dictatorship and bad-tempered state. At point four, too independent-minded, especially too free speech when getting furious with someone. They use words of dividing classes into this type or that type. For instance, this is the front group, for example. And if we look at page 0003336 in the English and 0042-7949 in the Khmer, we see that at the conclusion of the Congress, just prior to that, there were assignment issues. And the cell committee of the ministry, it state number one, Brother Van, number two, Comrade Hong, number three, Comrade Rune, number four, Comrade Van, and number five, Comrade Chim. Your Honour, I, I mentioned that document as it uh, provides an insight to the discussions uh, within, within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and their preoccupation with um, uh, locating enemies and supporting the revolution. Uh, and you'll see, when you look at that document, um, Brother Van's name appears throughout. I just mentioned a few of the entries. Your Honour, I'd now like to turn to E3-857, which is a comprehensive report um, produced by the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's entitled, Working with the Committees of Every Unit, 12th of September 1977, 0035-5487 in the English. And the very first paragraph of that report is entitled, Summary of the Reports from Every Unit. And the first point is Enemy Activities. Kamai 0086, 707, and French 0081-1327. And I quote, At our ministry's conference, it was noted that we have basically smashed and swept cleanly away the enemies, who were CIA, KGB, and UN territory swallowers basically smashed and swept cleanly away means that the major apparatuses belonging to the enemy who made the plans for and the, led the desire for a coup d'etat to see state power back from our workers and poor peasants have been smashed and swept cleanly away by us. We achieved unity on this problem of sweeping the enemy cleanly away in conjunction with this, we achieved unity that the enemy is not yet completely gone from our ministry or from any of its unit organisations. We must therefore continue sweeping cleanly away to make our ministry, like each and every one of its units, immaculate. Further down, just briefly, it states, if we look inside the ministry, as a whole, we see that 98% in the ministry as a whole have achieved cleanliness. That is, 98% are good and have an understanding of the problem of sweeping enemies cleanly away. However, another 2% continue to exist who are in the process of conducting activities. Further down, 
each and every unit of organisation must have a crystal clear perspective and keep constant track of things. We must overcome everything and do whatever needs to be done to prevent this 2% from laying eggs or expanding. Because otherwise, whenever there is any little problem, they will provoke contradictions and take the opportunity to break out of the nest and expand over and over from 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 per cent. Therefore, we must encircle, compress and enclose them down so that only 1.5 or 0.5 per cent remains. Your Honours, this document doesn't specifically state at the beginning that it's from Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but it's clear by references within it um, that that's uh, where it comes from. For example, I quote one reference, we must raise revolutionary vigilance really high because our ministry has rather a lot of contact with foreigners. Another entry, the political protocol and secretariat sections have very few workers and peasants. And another section states, example, the core duties of Office B1 are four. So it's clear on a read of the document we would submit that it comes from the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Your Honours, I won't quote any more passages from this document other than to say its, uh, its purpose seems to, or the content um, concentrates on uh, targeting enemies and building the socialist revolution. And it's submitted that, that by that fact, that is evidence or provides evidence of the role that the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Yang Sari, played um, during the period. Your Honour, if I can turn your uh, minds to another document, uh, E3 slash 1550. It's a letter contained in a confession of Hugh Nim, alias P. From this document, it, it appears that Hugh Nim was arrested on the 10th of April 1977. And in that letter, it's addressed at the beginning, Dear Communist Party of Kampuchea, whom I respect more than my life. Dear Bang Pol, Bang Nguyen, Bang Van, Bang Vaughan, Bang Q, and Comrade Hem. And then, as we read the letter further down, it's clear that uh, Hugh Nim was arrested on this date, and he's pleading to the addressees on the letter for his, for his life. And if I refer to paragraph um, Khmer 0003117 to 8, French 0076, 6888, and English 0075-9691, he states, I would like to inform the party unequivocally that I have neither betrayed the party nor worked as a CIA agent for A Son Nyok Tan, for revisionists or for any foreigners to infiltrate the party and to do, destroy the party at all. I will maintain such an absolute stance and confession even though the party may kill me. Next paragraph. First of all, I would like to ask a favour from the party. I will not escape. The party can detain me. However, please do not chain my legs. I cannot get used to it. I have insomnia and hepatitis, so I do not have energy. I ask the party to release. Please consider and grant me this favour. I will not run away. If I did, the party can shoot me down. This is a, a letter contained in a confession from S21, and the letter is addressed to um, 
the party. And uh, the party addressees are in order Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia, Yang Sari, Vaughan Vet, Son Sen, and Q San Pan. The relevance of this document, Your Honours, is that the people addressed on that on that letter by Hu Nim uh, obviously were perceived to have great power um, at that time, but they could uh, release someone from S21. Your Honour, if I can now uh, turn to uh, talking about um, power relations in the party, if we can now uh, turn to another document, a video, and the D number is D108 slash 32.2. I'll have the E number for you in a, a moment. It's a short clip from Ta Mok, uh, a member of the Standing Committee, who explains the power relationships in the Standing Committee. Mr. President, if I could ask that to be played. Uh, the AV, if, if the AV could play the video, if that's, thank you. The President, you may proceed. AV assistant, please play the clip as per the request by the co-prosecutor. Pol Pot, as I have mentioned, to be responsible for during Democratic Cambodia. Yang Sari, the number three. Nun Chia was number two. Yang Sari was number three. So Pim came in fourth, and I was the fifth. Slash one five four seven. This is a confession of Mig Tuch, alias Kem. He was the ambassador to Lao and he was detained at S twenty one. And if we look at the front page of that document, the annotation. It states, the, the document states, Ambassador to Lao about personal history of traitorous activities. And then it states, Dear brother, he has carried out two activities in Lao as follows. With the capitalists, he contacted the HCR and met in Tam, and they decided to send the Khmer immigrants to Lao, to Thailand, to be indoctrinated, to absolutely oppose the revolution, and then it refers to uh, how he worked closely uh, with the Yun. He worked closely with the Yun ambassador. The purpose of this document, Your Honours, is that in the top right-hand corner, there is an annotation um, stating Comrade Van. And the relevance of this document is that the ambassador obviously was from the Minister of Foreign, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and. Uh, Yang Sari has been advised of that fact that um, by this, by this uh, notation uh, that he is in S21 and the further information has been brought to his attention. Your Honours, if I can now um, show a video 
it's E3 slash 3052R. It's a documentary film produced by the Democratic Cambodia government and it's showing a CPK rally uh, where you will see Nguyen Chia, Yang Sari and other leaders on the podium. I, I would ask that that be played. The President, you may proceed. Every booth officials are now instructed to play the video clip. Mr. President, Mr. President, I would like to inform you that uh, this video does not have any sound.
Thank you, Your Honour. Um, again, the relevance of that uh, video we would submit uh, relates to the, the, uh, the power and authority that Yang Sari and the other senior leaders um, had um, at the time. Your Honours, if we could uh, turn to uh, a new document, E3-489. Which is a, a timeline chart uh, compiled, compiling Yang Sari's foreign travel during the period of Democratic Kampuchea, compared with uh, S21 records of arrest and execution of Ministry of Foreign Affairs staff. This document was produced by the Office of the Co, -Invest Co Investigating Judges, which was with the aim of comparing when people from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs were arrested or killed at S21, executed, um, whether or not uh, Yang Sari was in the country at the time that those arrests or killings uh, were occurring. We can call the chart up on the screen, but in just by way of by way of explanation, perhaps I'll just read the first couple of paragraphs of the chart to understand it more. The chart separates themes of evidence, imprisonment, and execution with foreign travel of Yang Sari. Um, it's placed on a timeline. And if we can show the timeline on the screen, which begins at the start of the DK period and uh, finishes at the end. In effect, the OS uh, Office of Co-Investor Judges Analyst used all of the records, all of the documentary records available on the case file uh, relating to absences of Yang Sari out of the country on uh, foreign missions or delegations against 115 records of foreign ministry staff who were believed to have been imprisoned and executed at S21, and that information is gained from the prisoner list. The analyst states on this document that 99 imprisonment and 85 execution dates were usable in the timeline chart as the remaining records contain incomplete dates. The conclusion by the analyst was that the attached timeline does not purport to be an exhaustive list of all foreign travel by Yang Sari, and it should be read in conjunction with any other testimonial evidence from witnesses. But certainly, from what we can see, and perhaps if it can be shown on the screen, what we can see with the chart, and if we can perhaps move to the next page, perhaps if we can go back to the first page again, please. We can see from the chart uh, the first two lines relate to execution uh, and imprisonment, and the third line relates to when Yang Sari was in or out of the country based on the records on the case file. Um, from an, analyzing that, it appears that based on this statistics, that Yang Sari was in the country for around 80% of the DK period. Um, alternatively, it was outside the country for about 20%, based on the information that was made available uh, to the analysts at OC, OCIJ. Our submission would be Based on that, that uh, Yang Sari's role, this document shows that Yang Sari's role was much more of an internal role uh, inside the country than an external one. And that's relevant to knowledge and activities um, that uh, would be conducted uh, by him during that period.
Your Honour, I would now like to turn to a final uh, document. And this is uh, E3 slash 89, and it's an interview uh, with uh, Stephen Hedder and Yang Sari on the 17th of December 1996. And in that interview, he asks uh, Yang Sari uh, a number of questions, but a pit particularly in relation to um, the policy at the time and uh, his involvement with the policies of the CPK. And in the opening most general question that was put to him by Stephen Hedder on the first page. It's a long question, but uh, it, it appears to have been understood by Yang Sari. The question from Stephen Hedder is, I want to start with the problem of genocide and ask for your comments on my assessment of this question. Based on the evidence I have seen so far, I believe that there was no plan to commit, commit genocide, but that a genocide took place as a result of a combination of four sets of policies and practices. First, there was a plan to carry out proletarianization by organizational methods, that is by compulsion, and very rapidly. Second, there was a plan to carry out Khmerization by the same forceful methods at the same speed. Third, anyone who opposed, resisted, or failed to carry out these plans could be considered an enemy or a traitor to the nation and the party because these plans were considered essential to making Cambodia into a strong socialist country capable of independence from the capitalist world and Vietnam. Fourth, anyone accused of being an enemy or traitor could be arrested by the security service, tortured into confessing and implicating others, and then killed. The power to arrest and torture and kill existed formally or informally from the center, right down through the zones, sectors, and districts in the cooperatives and within army units. And the use of torture created the most subjective multiplication of the number of enemies. At the same time, the economic and military failures of the revolution resulted in numerous deaths and more and more accusations of treason within the ranks. The overall result was genocide, even if it wasn't planned as such. To that long question, Yang Sari uh, responded, I also see things that way. That is why when I am asked whether it's accurate to speak in terms of genocide, I say that if what is meant is a planned genocide, aimed simply at making a race disappear, it seems to me there was no such plan. However, as you just said, the acts committed were aberrant, and once they were in motion, they caused great suffering to the nation. They are my views on your view. So like you said, as the revolution was beset by more and more complications and problems, the number of human beings who were said to have done wrong increased. I am in unison with you on this. And your, first, and your two points, first, that this was done in order to establish a formidable communist foundation for the country more quickly than on Vietnam, so that Vietnam would not be able to keep up and would not dare to try to take control Cambodia are true. This was generally true and was the common understanding of the leadership. And
further discussing the powers of the Standing Committee, Steve Hedder said, from what point in time was there a decision or an understanding that it was necessary to do things in this manner? Yang Sari, it was there right from the time victory was achieved in the five-year war against aggression. The notion was formulated from that time on. However, it was not until late 1975 that it was really stipulated that it was imperative to go all out to carry out a really fast communization to, in order to make it possible for the UN to take Cambodian impossible for the UN to take Cambodian territory. And that is when the acts that were committed began. However, this idea, the fear of being swallowed up by Vietnam, that Vietnam would come in and take over, had flowed through us since way back then. In fact, when we got involved in the war against the French, this was the idea. This fear that the UN might swallow Cambodia. Nevertheless, we made every effort to maintain solidarity with Vietnam in order to win over French colonization. So then, Steve Hedder, was there some sort of central committee level meeting in late 75 at which certain objectives were set forth in this regard? In September 1975, there was a meeting to decide what we had to do then to keep Vietnam from coming to take control of Cambodia. So was this decided at the standing committee level or the central committee as a whole? It was only the standing committee, not the central committee, the standing committee. So who was in the standing committee then and who was at the meeting? Virtually all of the standing, standing committee were there. Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia, Sao Pim, me, Sun Sen and Ta Mok. Steve Hedder, Ta Mok and Von Vett or not? Von Vett, Von Vett, yes. Steve Hedder and Q Sampan, no, but Q Sampan was present. Your Honours, thank you for the uh, opportunity today to uh, present some of the documents um, to the public in a uh, unified manner. We appreciate the opportunity, and that finishes uh, the presentation in relation to Yang Sari. The President, thank you, Mr. Co-Prosecutor. And it is now appropriate moment for the adjournment the chamber will adjourn and the next session will be resumed by 15 to 3.